This video is brought to you by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. All right, welcome back to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast, also heard on 101.5 FM KDON in Las Vegas and 98.5 The Bet in Las Vegas on radio. Uh, you are with Scott Branson and Mo Moten. We are here to talk Raiders football. Do us a favor, if you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please do so wherever you get your audio, even if you're a video a watcher, right? You watch us on video and that's how you consume the show usually. Just go ahead and do it on the audio side. That way, if you're ever out and you want to listen to it or you catch up or you missed it, you can do that as well. Also, watching us on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Hit that notifications bell. We also, also always appreciate a thumbs up. So we're back here talking Raiders football training camp well underway now. We got some things to talk about that we noticed. Of course, Mo Moten, my partner, is a senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report. He's also the Raiders columnist on sportsnot.com. You can follow him on X at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, and you can also follow my work up on sportsnot.com where I am a writer, editor, and host. We appreciate all those plugs and, and uh, you can come chat with us about stuff. Also, just want to remind you guys that uh, we will be picking up the, the, the frequency of the shows here. And uh, so, so we appreciate all the support. We also today will talk about Antonio Pierce, his press conference last week, what he said about the quarter, this quarterback battle, it's, it's heating up. I know. And people are, Oh, what do you mean? We'll explain that. We'll talk about it. Even the coach talked about it. Then we're going to give some more observations and sort of what we saw ourselves coming out of week one of, of training camp, but also what we heard from the beat writers, all the guys and gals on the ground covering the team and what stuck out. Then in the third segment, we get to your calls, the voice of the fan there, which is the Raider nation mailbag. Got some great calls with some of our uh, all-star callers, some of the guys who call in a lot here. Got some of those, as well as some text messages. So stick around for that. All right, Mo, we look back uh, uh, at the first week of press uh, of press coverage of the Raiders. And, of course, it starts with Antonio Pierce has a press conference late last week on Thursday, I believe it was. And um, he talked. One of the first questions was, okay, you got Aiden O'Connell. You got Gardner Minshew. We know they're going to battle for this first this QB one job. And I found it really interesting and refreshing, frankly, and, and appreciate it, what he said. And I'm going to quote this and then we'll talk about it because Pierce said, yeah, I see what I see is two guys competing. I told them it's time to make that leap. Stop with baby steps. Somebody's got to grab the bull by the horns and be the guy. And, and they're trying to do that. So Mo, I like this expectation setting of look, Oh, yeah, it was all nice in the offseason talking about, oh, Gardner, oh, Aiden, oh, this, oh, that. Now it's like, hey, guys, you got to get it down the field. And, oh, by the way, Antonio Pierce, new head coach, he's got a team that can compete now. They got to have good quarterback play. I appreciate his message. Yeah, basically, it's it. coaches use media and press conferences to talk to their players, the good ones do. <laughs> yeah. And basically, he's saying, I, I read it as, you know, one of you guys has to separate because from what I've read or reports coming out of camp, there's really no separation. Antonio Pierce came out, I believe his first press conference since the Raiders came back to practice at Costa Mesa and said that, you know, there is no clear cut leader. So no one yet has separated. You wouldn't expect someone to separate, you know, from spring practices, no pads. Of course, pads will be on soon, but it's basically a message to both quarterbacks. Like if you want this job, you're going to have to take it because Gardner Minshew, because you're a veteran, we're not going to just hand it to you. Ain't no kind just because you were here last year and played with these guys last year. We're not just going to hand it to you. Someone has to step up and take the job. And I think, I don't think that happens until the preseason. And I said this on my bleach report live mm -hmm. that, you know, you can have all the practices you want, but I think playing opponent in live action is a very different variable and you're able to see how guys react to actual pressure in the pocket, how guys are reading defenses, even though they're mostly vanilla, and how they, you know, distribute the football. And I think that's going to be important. And that's why I think this quarterback battle is going to go all the way through the last preseason game. Yeah, it, 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 it makes sense for it to go all the way through, even if one seems ahead of the other at some point during the practice part of this until they get to a game start starting next week, by the way then you have to see how they perform under pressure against live action. And that's where the job will be won. That's why I was not surprised, uh, at least from a quarterback perspective, and you talked about this, go, oh, geez, going back to maybe May or June, and that is to, these guys will see time in preseason in the games. It's not going to be like they're not going to play a lot. They will play 
my guess would be at at the very least a quarter each in each of these games but we'll see what the, what Antonio Pierce decides there but that's where you're going to be able to see it and and I really believe the more you look at it now I know there's question marks and we've talked a lot of uh, this show but staying with the glass half full approach here mo that I know fans like more than 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 those of us who try to stay objective and sometimes is I really do think that the Raiders and what they've done with this roster they're not saying hey we're building this roster to win in 3 years they're doing it to win now, to be competitive now. And if that's the case, that quarterback play is going to be so important and you can't underscore how important enough it is. Not saying these guys have to be all pros, but they have to make things happen. They have to step up, be the leader that this team needs them to be on offense. And um, in essence, I think he was just in reiterating what we kind of already know. Listen to the, what the leaders have said during the offseason so far. Max Crosby said, I'm tired of losing. And Max Crosby's been with the race since 2019. I'm tired of losing. Devontae Adams, you don't want to, if you you want to keep him happy, you don't want to waste away, his, you know, his the back end of his optimal years. You got to start winning some football games. So your two leaders on opposing sides of the football want to win now. So I think that's the general message that you're not hearing players saying, you know, we're trying to build slowly. And of course, you want to build a contender over time but as you said the message is to win right now and i think this is why and we're going to talk a little bit more about this hopefully jack jones robert splain came out about out media outlets saying the Rays are only going to win six games or fewer and i think that that message resonates in the locker room that wants to win now like hey we're not a rebuilding team right. that's going to win five or six games and have a top five top ten draft pick we're trying to win now, and they they took that personally. Uh, you can insert should. the Michael Jordan. You can insert the Michael Jordan say the last dance meme, and, <laughs> and I took it personally. And yeah. Jack Jones, for them to come out, Jack Jones last week and come out and actually publicly say, "Look, that that pisses us off that we're projected to go six and eleven, and Antonio Pierce is ranked as the twenty eighth best head coach in the league, I think, by ESPN." And Robert Spillane came out and said, while we don't let it, I'm paraphrasing for him, while we don't let it, you know, plan our minds over and over again, we do see these predictions and we do take it personally. And we are going to try to prove you wrong about those. Exactly. And, and that's the beauty of, of the meritocracy of professional sports, which is it doesn't matter what we say about them. It doesn't matter what NFL pundits or other teams say about them. They have the opportunity once a week to go out and prove everybody wrong. And it seems as though this team, to your point about Jack Jones, about Splain, they've, man, this team is together. Like I, look, I'm not there like a lot of the beat writers and, and, and some of these guys. So we'll see that come out, I'm sure. But I just see the cohesiveness here, that culture that Antonio Pierce has talked so much about building, Mo, it seems as though it's taking hold. Now, you start getting hit in the mouth, things can change quickly, but I don't think so. I think even if this team goes out and struggles at times, I think they have a much different mentality. And, and you pointed it out very, and this is very significant. You pointed out the leadership on this team. When you talk about a Devontae Adams, when you talk about a Max Crosby, those guys are, aren't are just like, well, they're the veteran of the team. Those guys are two of the best players in the NFL, right? So that the gravity and the weight that they hold within that locker room, especially for those young guys coming in, uh, this team, I just have a feeling this team, even when they lose, because they will lose games, even when they lose, I just see them going out there and fighting to the last man can't fight anymore. Who says they're going to lose games, Scott? I hear a lot of fans <laughs> who believe they're going. I know Murph 19. sent me a note. They're going undefeated. No, I'm kidding. He they're did. going undefeated. I Shout mean, out to Murph. Do you, do you, I mean, 20 no? What is that? <laughs> Go, you're going 17 and 0 in the regular season, winning, winning yes. in the divisional round, winning the conference championship game, winning the Super Bowl. 20 and 0, Scott. Don't don't huh? doubt an undefeated hey, season. I, I had one of our listeners uh, uh, post on X at me. I was talking about something. I wasn't even talking about record, but he reached out. I'm sorry I didn't keep the the, the post. I'll I'll go back and find it and give him credit next time. But he said, "Hey, they're going five and zero to start the season." I was like, "Wow, now that's going to Baltimore, beating Baltimore, like woo." Okay, hey, he could be right. You never know. But that's my point, though. I think that this team. And it worked for the Raiders in the old days. And I'm not one of these people who think that the football game hasn't changed as much as it has, because it has from when the Raiders were in their heyday. But I go back to even my alma mater, right? When, when I was at UNLV and UNLV basketball was so good, it was them against the world. Everybody wanted them to lose. Everybody didn't think they could do this, do that. And that's a very powerful thing. Now, you need the success. You need to buy into that. And then you have to channel it into execution. If they do that, Mo, I think this team has the ability to surprise everybody. 
when you look at Antonio Pierce's history, you remember the Super Bowl team that he was on? Mm-hmm. You know, that team snuck into a wild card spot, knocks off the undefeated New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. <laughs> no one gives them a chance. Everyone thinks the Patriots are going to run the table and be one of these historic teams in history, the most, probably the most historic team in history, you know, over the 1972 Dolphins, of course. But he has that mentality. He, he, he could say, look, I've been in a situation where I, my team has been doubted or we weren't expected to do much or they call our quarterback Eli Manning mediocre or average. I didn't think we can go very far. Now, remember, that Giants team was most led by physicality, their defense. You know, Eli Manning, while people quibble about him being in the whole thing because he has those two Super Bowl rings, for most of his career, Eli Manning has been looked at as an average quarterback. He was right. never looked at as a top-tier Quarterback who's going to throw for 40 touchdowns, 4,000 yards, 30 something touchdowns. So when you look at Antonio Pierce's Super Bowl team and you look at this Raiders team currently, I think there are some similarities where the defense could be just as good, if not better. You can possibly run the ball effectively with Zamir White. Maybe we'll talk about an addition at running back. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But with, with, with the pieces that they have, this is not a team, and I'm going to say this again. This is, this is a team that's closer to being a perennial playoff contender than a team that's picking top five, top eight in the draft order every year simply because of what's around them. Devontae Adams is still there. Jacoby Myers had a great year last year. Samir White coming along when Josh Jacobs goes down. Their offensive line, there's some shuffling there, but they got some early draft picks. They got a stalwart starter in Colton Miller. They believe in Thayer Mumford. You bring in Brock, Brock Bowers. You got Michael Mayer, are you the, the best two tight end set in the league? Mm-hmm. And then, again, that defense is still going to keep them close in a lot of football games. It's can the offense do just enough uh, in critical moments to get them over the hump. Right, and to just bring it back around to where we started here with with Pierce talking about, and I said taking the gloves off with the quarterbacks, which is like somebody's got to step up, man. Like it's, you know, we're not we're not pussyfooting anymore. It's 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 time to play ball. It's time for one of you guys to take the bull by the horns and go. That's what he said, and I think that that's so important for every reason you just talked about, and you talked about Pierce being on that Giants team that beat the Patriots, all that stuff. You got you're gonna have to have one of these guys. To, to reach this team's full potential. And I say full potential. And you just mentioned the defense. The defense can do a lot to, to make up for some, some offensive uh, deficiencies, but it can't do it all. So, <clears throat> and for the Raiders, I look at what happened this past weekend, Bo. The deal's handed out to Tua, Tunga Viola down in Miami. The deal handed out to Jordan Love in Green Bay. The Raiders really need, <laughs> in my view, and listen, I've been, and I'm not changing my view yet, but they need Aiden O'Connell, I think, to, to show that he can be a franchise guy, okay? I expect him to win the starting job. I still do. Now, we'll see what happens. And Minshew is who he is. Good good asset to have, a good guy to have there. But with all that's happening now, Dak Prescott is you know going to hit free agency maybe, or do the Cowboys give him a big deal? If they do, the Raiders are going to be in a tough position because they're going to be good, and they're going to be able to win football games. So they're not going to be in the position to, I think, get a pick high in the draft uh, so they might have to play the free agent game. But that's why this quarterback thing, not just a competition, but what it means to the overall play and the offense and Luke Getze, we'll go back to that, it's going to be big this year. I think this is a really pivotal year from that perspective because the Raiders are going to have to figure out they're going to be at a fork in the road. And is Tom Telesco going to say, I got to give up whatever assets I got to give up to go find a quarterback because it didn't work out as well as we wanted it to with the other two guys? Or they say, man, we got a gem here and Aiden O'Connell, yeah, he's not quick, he's not – but we got a good offensive line and now he had a good year and he's building on what he's done and we're going to stick with him. I think that's sort of what they're looking at. Absolutely. If you're looking, if you're looking at the future, you just have to figure out what you have because you don't, Correct. I mean, you don't really know what you have in a no in year two yet. You want to see if there's some development. A lot of players either take a step forward. Some take a step back. Some don't grow much at all between their first and second year. So you want to see what that is. And that's primarily where I believe if it's even a no comic, it's a start. But you can't discount Gardner Minshew, who's no. been a solid starter as a six rounder coming out of Washington, Washington State. Not a lot of not a ton of six rounders are starting in the league. So the fact that he was able to get a starting job and able to start in other places, you know, I believe a few starts or a couple of starts in Philly. But to take over for Anthony Richardson with the Indianapolis Colts last year, and he's a totally different quarterback than totally. Anthony Richardson. Yes. So Shane Steichen had to completely scrap, you know, the game plans of how he was going to run his offense with Anthony Richardson versus Gardner Minshew. And Gardner Minshew almost made it work. 
if not for CJ Stroud, the Houston Texans being the biggest surprise <laughs> in the NFL, the Colts are in the playoffs and they possibly yeah. have a chance, you know, to advance and, and, you know, play the Browns who got blown out by the Houston Texans. So we can't discount either of these guys. But Scott, really quick, I want to go back to this my Super Bowl comparison. Now, Raider fans, if you listen to me, I'm not saying the Raiders are going to go to the Super Bowl and, and win it. But what I'm saying is that the, the similarities between Pierce's 2007 Giants team and this Raiders team, the Giants that year they won the Super Bowl were were middle of the road in offense and defense. I'm looking mm-hmm. at it right now. 14th in scoring offense, 17th in scoring defense. They were, uh, what is it, 7th in total yards on defense and 16 total yards on offense. So I know this that's a different era. That's you know almost 20 years ago. But the fact that you can build a team with a strong defense and, and a strong run game because they had a top they had a top five top eight run game that year with Brandon Jacobs and I believe Derek Ward. I mean, you can use some of that formula in today's league. Now, of course, again, different era, different league. Now, where you're going to need more from your offense, specifically, specifically your quarterback. But you can take some of that from the from the defensive side and say, okay, we may not throw for 300 yards a game. We may not throw three touchdowns a game. We may not have a 4,000 yard passer. But we can't have a top 10 rushing offense. We can be top five, maybe top three in scoring defense and total yards on on the defensive side of the ball. Mm -hmm. I think it was Anders who said this, that, you know, each team has its strengths and weaknesses. There are teams that are strong at quarterback. There are teams that are strong on offense. There are teams that are strong on defense. There are teams that are strong with the run game. There are teams that are strong with the pass game. The Raiders have to lean on their strengths, not depend on them, but lean on their strengths and hope to have an even keel across the board. Well said. All right. That's where we're going to close this first segment of this edition of Silver and Black today. We appreciate you guys being with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about other observations from the first week of camp. How's the offense? How's the defense? What do we take from that, by the way? This early in camp, can you really make any assumptions based on what's happening? We'll talk about that as well. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black today. And now a word from our friends at BetUS. Michael Vick at BetUS.com. Catch an incredible 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits plus 10% gambler's insurance. BetUS, my online sports book and casino. All right, there we are back for segment number two here of Silver and Black today and Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. Please subscribe wherever you get your audio rate and review for us as well. If you're watching us on YouTube or any other video platforms, make sure you subscribe, hit that notifications bell, and also the thumbs up. We appreciate it. We're talking Raiders training camp, Scott Branson, Mo Moten with you, and um, we are back. Boy, I'll tell you what, it's weird. The training camp stuff, uh, of course, we've seen more coverage, Mo. We've seen more things coming out, but it's not the deluge yet, right? Next week, we start getting some of these preseason games, and it seems like now, of course, the Olympics started, Americans aren't really crazy about the Olympics, even though the ratings did pretty well uh, over the weekend, except for basketball. Of course, people are interested in watching U.S. basketball. But other than that, uh, they're waiting for their football. You're starting to see the networks kind of creep back in with live coverage. Uh, and so it's 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 here, man. And I know Raider fans are excited. They just want to get this thing started. Baldy's making his rounds, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, you're starting to see more players uh, talking about the progress that's happening at camp. You're starting to see more you know, progress reports. People are asking us when are we going to start up our fantasy football league draft, <laughs> yes. extent, by the way. Yes. Uh, so you can feel football coming along, even though it's still a little warm outside. Mm. You know, we're getting into August pretty soon. But once that preseason, once that first preseason game kicks off on Thursday between the Bears and the Texans, we're back in the mode. Then, then there, there are no more weeks of football list uh, Thursday to Thursday to, to Sundays left. We can plunge right into it and dig into Raider football. Yes, and it's it's interesting because our hours, how we work changes, right? When you get to the football mm-hmm. season, because I've been during the summer, I've been able to kind of do Monday through Friday. Now it's going to be basically Sunday through Thursday, Thursday. in essence, is kind of how, how I work. I know you kind of similar. And so it's it's very different um, and and getting my family ready for that, too, as well, making plans and <laughs> all that kind of jazz. But anyway, we're back talking Raiders football. And Mo, you mentioned towards the end of the first segment, you were talking about how this defense, you know, this team might be like that Giants team or could be, I should say, like that Giants team that, that Antonio Pierce was part of in that the defense might have to carry them a little more if the offense is good, OK and good, but not great. Um, 
and what we saw coming out of week one, this is based on reports from the Raiders, of course, and of course, our good friends who are all beat writers down there uh, that, that have been covering the story, is that sort of not surprised it followed the same kind of track and narrative as we saw coming out of minicamp, which was defense far ahead of the offense, and defense looks really good. A lot of guys running around. Of course, we've heard some great things about Dylan Lobby, who a Antonio Pierce talked about at the press conference, and some of the other guys on offense as well. But um, and what for you, what did you take away from this first week based on what we're hearing coming out of Costa Mesa? You kind of mentioned it there, Dylan Lowby. I I've been saying this since they drafted him. If you watch his, if you watch his games, he's a very he's a natural pass catcher. And he's made for the third down pass catching role. Mm. No disrespect to Mir Abdullah, who's a veteran, but he's a veteran, about 30 years old. You're always looking for the next youngest thing. If if the if the next youngest player is just as productive as your as your veteran player. So I, you know, I know the Raiders re-signed Amir Abdullah this offseason, but if Dylan Lalby is showing out, and I believe Vinny Bots and you have the Las Vegas you, you Journal even pointed him out as well. I, I think the third down pass catching role is his. That's one thing that mm -hmm. stuck out to me on under the radar, not some of the biggest headlines, of course. The other thing is something I also mentioned in in the first segment about Jack Jones. I'm noticing Jack Jones is becoming more of a leader. Yes. And that's just listening to him at his press conferences. I I, we, I don't know if we're going to get into it. We may have a call or two on this, but the whole Kermit the Frog stuff. Yeah, we got a call. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, yes. He, he kind of, he, it, it struck me as he's speaking as a leader. I know he kind of lashed out on, on, on Twitter, on X, you know, to the, someone who was involved in it. And I, you know, I actually spoke to that person, but yeah. um, Jack Jones to me is striking me as another leader in that locker room. So now if you look at the Raiders leadership core, I'm looking at guys like obviously Max Crosby, Devontae Adams, but I'm also looking at Jack Jones and Robert Spillane, who also spoke, who I also said spoke out about those not so favorable predictions about the Raiders season record. But Jack Jones to me is standing out simply because one, he knows Antonio Pierce well. They go way back to his his high school years, and and two, he's you know he's made mistakes in his life, but sure. we don't hold we we understand that people make mistakes in their younger years, and you you can grow from that, and now you can you know warn other players or give other players your story and insight on how they can avoid some of the mistakes you made on and off the field. So I I think that's his growth his personal growth has been eye opening for me, and I look at Jack Jones as the leader that some people thought Marcus Peters would be never. I never looked at Marcus Peters as a leader based on his career. I know he's had some trouble early back in his days at Washington, but now when I hear Jack Jones speak, he just sounds a lot different to me. And he's look like, and looks like he's taking on one of those leadership positions. Well, and I think that stems, I mean, listen, what happened last year for him coming over to the Raiders, his relationship with Antonio Pierce, how far it went back. We all know that story, but to me, it's like, Hey, Antonio Pierce brought him in and and basically did what Al Davis used to do, right? You ready for this? Which is be yourself. Like be yourself. Don't be don't be stupid. Don't do things that are counterproductive to the team. Play your game, which he did very well for this team when he got over. And then be yourself. And what Jack Jones has done, and I'm so glad you brought this up because it was one of mine too, which is he's just basically said, "Look, I am the leader of this defensive back group. I I, I am. I'm taking I'm taking that mantle." Because they have it at linebacker, they have it on the defensive line with Max Crosby clearly, mm -hmm. and so he said, "Look, we got kids back here, and we don't know if they're going to add some veterans or not. But I got to take charge. I got to get these guys. We got to get better because they know they've improved up front with Christian Wilkins. They've improved at linebacker. They they have Spillane coming back. Hopefully, he has the same kind of year he had last year. So they understand that a lot of the pressure on the defensive side to get better is on them. So Jack Jones is challenging them at, and the Kermit the Frog thing we'll talk about when the call." We do the call in the third segment, but that's another example. And, and you, you spotlighted it perfectly, which is when things like that happen, you don't get all nasty and gross. You just take the kid aside and you say, listen, I know it wasn't your idea, but understand how that plays into me. Now you can understand as a college kid, because it was Taylor from Air Force came in. He, you come in and you do something innocent. You're just hanging out with a fan. You're doing the right thing. You're talking to fans, right? But then the media takes it, and what do they do with it? Boom! Now it's it's bulletin board material for Patrick Mahomes. So so a good good point, and I think that that's the one thing. And then Mo, I think some of the some of what we heard about the offense, the offense to me is going to be interesting because yes, the quarterback situation, but with Colton Miller still 
not back with Jackson Powers Jan Johnson going to be maybe not even ready for the preseason from what we're hearing and what Tom Telesco said um, that to me coming out of, it's hard to understand where the offense is at when you're not at full strength. So I had a bleach report live the day the Raiders had practice. I believe it was last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Tom Telesco came out and spoke on Colton Miller and Jackson Powers Johnson. This was his update. He said, Colton, he said he believes Jackson Powers Johnson will be back sooner than later. He doesn't believe Jackson Powers Johnson is going to be out for a while. He said Colton Miller, though, on the other hand, could be a couple of weeks. Right. So if if I'm, take, if I'm taking Tom Telesco's words, you know, at face value, what I'm reading into this is possibly JPJ being back before the preseason game, though, mm -hmm. as a rookie. You don't want to just throw him out to the fight. You want to kind of ease him in, especially because he's missed so much time between now and uh, from OTAs to now. With Colton Miller, a um, couple of weeks to a month, you, you just hope, again, that he's back before week one. And I think I said this on the last show that it's going to be Andrews Pete at left tackle, and I, and I believe that's what that's what it was at practice last week, and mm -hmm. Cody Whitehair at left guard. And, again, Andrews Pete, a 10-year veteran, Cody Whitehair, a nine-year veteran. You have two veterans on the left side there that should be able to hold the position down until your projected starters come back. You just hope that Colton Miller is back because, again, while you have two veterans, you know, maybe on the back side of their primes, maybe past their primes, if you're talking about Cody Whitehair, you got Col you got Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, you know, week, week one. one, which is a tough one. And and that's going to be a, that's a tough challenge for any offensive lineman, let alone – Two guys who are who are veterans and projected to be backups. So that that's one thing that stood out to me about what Tom Telesco said about the offensive line. That's my again, it's not a it's not a panic button situation yet. No. I'd want to I'd wait till mid August to see where the Raiders are on the left side of the offensive line before I even think about touching the panic button. Exactly, and I think too one thing that I always point out with offensive lines is yeah, you might be a left tackle and the other guy on the other side is the right tackle, but the offensive line as a unit does need to be a cohesive unit they un, they need because of especially now you have a new uh, play caller you have a new system with those with those gap blocking schemes and so you all have to be on the same page and so when two guys are missing even one guy the caliber of colton miller that too messes with because even if he gets back let's say colton miller doesn't step on the field until prep for practice uh, on week one of the season and he goes in week one great you love him there but you're still it's it's it, it, it like you said, it's not panic button, but it just puts you a little bit uh, in behind some challenges. And so the Raiders are going to have to deal with that. But that's part of the game. Injuries, all that stuff are part of the game. And then the quarterbacks, they can do a lot also to help with that, meaning that are they able to get rid of the ball? Are they able to read the defense as well enough to avoid the Bosa's and the Max when they're coming in so that they can uh, help their offensive line there as well? And then we go back to the defensive backs we just talked about well so all that stuff is going to come into play but that was that was to me i didn't feel like there was and it was a light week compared to this week where we'll see a lot more action obviously coming out of practice and hear a lot more but overall to me not a lot of surprises i think that uh, as this team eases in as they they decide to um i think settle on certain people at certain positions then we'll start to get a better sense for what the plans are uh, for them to hit week one and we'll also clearly get some of that when we get to next week with the first preseason game. So two things that two interesting tidbits that emerged last week that I found that worth noting mm -hmm. one, Aaron Wilson of KPRC two in Houston noted that the Raiders checked in with cam acres before he signed with Houston, Texas. So the Raiders may be sniffing around on a veteran running back still, which it's kind of interesting to me because they they did sign Alexander Madison. So if they sign another running back who could could, could, could could be for a job, does it mean that it's going to be a true committee with Zamir White maybe getting mm. you know ten to twelve carries and and then Alexander Madison whoever they sign mixing in for a total of you know combined ten carries and then Dylan Alby and Amir Dua they got a lot of pieces at running back no no star guys but it, it seems to me that they if they do sign a, a veteran running back that. You're gonna get, you know, a rotation of maybe four guys touching the football between running and pass catching duties. The other thing was my guys starting to get some buzz. Jacorian Bennett, uh, teammates of Jacorian Bennett, uh, coaches have been talking up Jacorian Bennett, saying that he could take that second year leap. And I think, um, I, I think Marcus Johnson from Tape Don't Lie was at mm -hmm. practice, and he said he believes that Jacorian Bennett is gonna get that job. And I've been on the Jacorian Bennett bandwagon 
Sister Edge drafted him in the fourth round. And I felt like this is now his opportunity. For him. I don't want to say now or never, but going against Brendan Faison, who's he's been a career, you know, spot starter backup, a seven-year veteran. I think this is one of those opportunities where he could take Antonio Pierce's message of taking the bull by horns, by the horns and winning that job for the number two cornerbacks by opposite Jack Jones. And boy, would that be huge for this team. If, if he could step up and be that guy where they don't need to go sign anybody else or don't need to rely on a journeyman like Faison, to me, that would be so massive for that defensive backfield. But like you said earlier, too, with Jack Jones, Jack Jones has got that unit moving together, right? And so the influence there, what he's doing, what they're working on, being second year in the, in the NFL for, for Bennett, to me, uh, that's big. And, and I would love to see that happen. I think, you know, we talk about, too often, I think sometimes, what if this doesn't work out? What if that doesn't work out? But in this case, it's like, if it works out, if that works out and he does nail down that position and plays well, especially with who the Raiders are facing, boy, that's going to look like a, a pretty nice pick from the previous regime, uh, uh, even though they had some other stinkers. So there you go. But yeah, I mean, look, we'll, we'll find out more this week. We'll see what, what, what transpires. We'll get some health updates, hopefully, um, not maybe this week, but next week on the two offensive linemen, as we talked about with Colton Miller and JPJ. So it'll be interesting to see how it all unfolds. Mo, anything else from training camp that, that surprised you? The, the Kermit thing, again, I'm going to save for the call because we do have a caller on that. Uh, other than that, though, I think the team, what you're hearing from them, it all sounds good. It all sounds consistent from what we've been hearing since, what, last March? Right. N not that this surprised, but one other thing that I did note, um, it's it's been said that Isaiah Polo Mile is, is that third safety. And which means that he's possibly could be leapfrogging Christopher Smith, the second who the Raiders mm -hmm. drafted in the fifth round, I believe, and moved up for him um, last year. So I, I like to I would like to see more of Isaiah Polamai. I think he has the body frame to do a lot of different things, match up with tight ends, play the run, has some coverage skills. Every time I read a report about practice or every time I watch a preseason game. Isaiah Polo Mile is making plays. I know it's preseason yeah. and practice, yeah. but that could translate to the regular season. I want to see more of Isaiah Polo Mile on the field. I think he could be a matchup difference maker with his size. He's about 6'4 in the 220s or two teens, whatever the case may be, but he's a bigger safety, and you can play a lot of big nickel with Isaiah Polo Mile on the field. Right. Also some good buzz about Tommy Eichenberg, right? Mm -hmm. People saying how sneaky he is he might he might surprise a lot of people with his because he's not known as this big athletic guy. He's just a, a, an animal, frankly. He's great. So we'll see how that gets. But we'll see more of that unfold this week uh, out in Costa Mesa. So that'll be interesting. All right. We are going to take our final break here on this edition of Silver and Black today. When we come back, it's your turn. We are going to the Raider Nation mailbag. We're going to hear the voice of the fan. We'll hear some calls, some text messages. So don't go anywhere. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black today. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from you. Many Oakland Raider fans, Las Vegas Raider fans, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. That, that, that black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right. That's right. It's your turn. Mailbag time. We got some some good text messages, Mo. And right. by the way, the, the new intro, the new music, the new stuff you all hear, you'll you'll see some new visuals coming too. So stay tuned. We like to freshen it up every season. So get ready for that. And thanks to the folks at Odyssey for doing that. Uh, but uh, you are here on Silver and Black today. Scott and Mo with you. We are doing the Raider Nation mailbag. By the way, Mo, now, look, the season, I get why some people kind of check out. And but now there's no there's no reason not to take part. You got these questions. There's news coming out of camp. 702-900-7869. 702-900-7869. You can leave us a message there. Name, where you're calling from, and then your question. Or you could text us. And I'm going to get to a text first. Mo, you ready for this? So I got to read out loud. Hopefully I don't... Uh, have marbles in my mouth on this one. All right. It says, hey, guys, big fans. Love your content. Objective analysis of the team. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. That's a huge compliment. One thing I haven't heard about Aiden O'Connell is about the player that he needs to be to be great or even just a consistent starter. What I think we need is him to channel his inner Peyton Manning. Peyton was never athletic, had a good arm, but not a deep threat. 
but what he brought is hard work, accuracy, and uh, cerebral ability, dissect and analyze, expose the defense before every snap. He had a voice and took over the offense to the point it was an art form. Hated it in Denver, but you can appreciate it. It seems like AOC has the potential accuracy and arm talent to compare to Manning and seems to have the motivation to learn and put the work in the offseason in the film room. If he can become elite Peyton Manning-like player upstairs in the head, he has the ability to be a top 10 quarterback in the league and overcome some of the mobility issues. Do you think he shows any signs of being that sort of player in the future? Thanks again for your great work. Scott from Canada, America's hat. He's up north. Good day to you, sir. Thank you. Um, so there's Scott from Canada. So Aiden O'Connell, Peyton Manning, the huge shoes to fill and to compare to, <laughs> but Mo, I think he hits on something here, which we've talked about with our listeners over the last few months about this, which is yes, he's never going to be that mobile guy, that more quote unquote modern quarterback who can not run all the time, but is athletic enough to do a lot with his feet with what we know about Aiden O'Connell. Can he elevate himself into being a top 10 quarterback in your view? Obviously he can. I mean, when you when he was drafted, one of the things that Dave Ziegler said, Dave Ziegler is now with the Saints organization, but Dave Ziegler was the Raiders GM when they drafted Aiden O'Connell. And Dave Ziegler said he had the neck up qualities, right? So that's basically what Scott is talking about in his text about Peyton Manning. The neck up qualities. Being able to read, understand defenses, know where the pressure is coming from, uh, know where to put the football. You know, that's part of your arm talent. But of course, you have to you have to know where to go with the football. Oh, yeah. And you have to have your you have to have your head on the swivel and be able to get the ball out quickly. Now, that's a little bit of of physical and the mental together. Now, he's never going to be a guy that's going to, you know, consistently escape pressure. We don't expect him to be that. But if he can read defenses and I think that's that's something that a lot of quarterbacks can do to overcome some of their physical deficiencies. Uh, he could definitely be a, a, a top quarterback in this league. It would be a surprise to a lot of people. But if you're looking at how he can do it, as the e, as the texter said in Scott in Canada, and as I just alert, alluded to, he's going to have to do it with his mind since he can't do it with his feet in the pocket. Now, while yeah. Peyton Manning is a big stretch, I compared Aiden O'Connell, his ceiling, to Kirk Cousins with a stronger arm. So Kirk Cousins is not very mobile. He wasn't mobile right. before this Achilles injury he had last year. <laughs> but he was able to start in Washington and play well. He was able to start in Minnesota and, and be a multi-time Pro Bowl. I believe he has four Pro Bowls on his resume. I remember people, he's talking about Kirk Cousins, like, oh, he's, he's a mid-tier quarterback, whatever. He has four Pro Bowls on his resume. He's consistently thrown for over 4,000 yards. He's consistently thrown for 30 or close to 30 touchdowns, 30-plus 30 touchdowns a year. And he's not very mobile. He's just out there reading defenses and putting the ball where it should be. You talk about accuracy. I think Scott mentioned that in his text. Accuracy, very important. So if Aiden O'Connell, you know, can can improve his accuracy, now it actually wasn't terrible last year, but if he can complete about 67% of his passes, and, and again, just be just neck up qualities, being able to diagnose things really quickly, mm -hmm. you know, he could be a Pro Bowl quarterback. And I know a lot of people are going to snicker and laugh at that, but I mean, I'm sure a lot of people would snicker and laugh at that if I said that about Kirk Cousins 10 years ago. <laughs> well, and again, I, I've said, I've been on the record, and, and he could prove me wrong. I've been on the record saying that I just don't believe he's a franchise quarterback. That doesn't mean that he can't be a good quarterback or that he might be the guy for right now. I mean, let's face it, if the Raiders are are pretty good, which they appear to be, then then you're not going to get in the top five picks of the draft. And those guys aren't guaranteed anyway. But in my view, this is the year. If he's going to do it, this is where you'll find out. So um, I don't believe it yet, but he has a way to prove that. And if he does this year, I'll be the first one to admit it. And for all the right reasons, because I think he is a smart guy. I think he's got the, the makeup to be a professional quarterback. Because even when things go bad, as you noticed last year, Nothing seemed to shake him, and that's a huge deal. That's what you do see in quarterbacks like Peyton Manning. Uh, he needs to be more vocal, which is what Antonio Pierce told him to do in the offseason. So I expect that, which is good, but you're always going to be who you are. So just to see a little improvement there would be great. But uh, Scott in Canada, appreciate the message, oh, the, the, Texas. the, the Texas. text uh, from Canada. So thank you for that. I appreciate it all the time. All right. We're going to get on to our next call. This is Jesse on the phone. Jesse from Arizona. Here we go. Hey, what's up? Scott and Mo. This is Jesse from Arizona. 
Um, I just wanted to chime in. Things are a little slow, so I was like, eh, I might as well, you know, call in. <laughs> but uh, I was going to call in reference about the uh, the Kermit, the, the Patrick Mahomes thing at, at Fragment. <laughs> you know what, man? I'm calling on behalf of all Raider Nation. I say we don't give up about, about Patrick Mahomes or the media. I don't care what they think. I don't care. You know what? Nobody was making a big old fuss when they did the freaking merry-go-round in the middle of a game. You know, oh, that was all good. So, no, I think that uh, that's good. You know, let the guys go ahead and make a little bit of fun. I know it was, you know, whatever. It was, it was a, a fan that brought it out and whatnot. But I don't think the Raiders should shy away from that whatsoever, man. You know, some grit. Yeah, we're pissed off. We, we've been losing to you guys. But we're ready. You know, we, we want – to win and we want to beat the Chiefs and we want to put Mahomes on his ace. So <laughs> I say let it have it. Let him have it. Um on a second note, I too Mo am a uh Jacorian Bennett believer. There you go, Mo. Um, I feel like for our sanity yeah. we have to be right because um <laughs> that's kind of our best next best option. So I really yeah. hope the kid pulls through man and shows shows uh what he's made of. So and uh yeah last prediction I, I think uh Aiden O'Connell is going to be starting quarterback and he's going to have I'd say about let's say twenty five touchdowns, eight interceptions, and he's gonna throw for about thirty five hundred yards. Yeah. All right. Thanks guys. I'm out. Raiders <laughs> Jesse in Arizona, thanks for the call, man. Great call uh on that one. And now we can talk about the Kermit thing. So Everybody overreacted. I was one because I thought it was from the players. And then we found out it was a fan, one of the fans that was one of the VIP fans out there. And the fan owned it and said, hey, no, it was mine. And you get a rookie takes it and started playing with it, you know, innocently, innocently, not really thinking about it. Um, and so so I understand what Jesse's saying. Like, you know what? You should talk a little trash about your rival, especially division rival. There is a I think there is a line that you have to be careful not to cross over. And I say this, and you guys can all say, oh, screw the cheese, whatever. But our good friend, Kelly Kreiner, remember, Mo, when, when this happened, he texted. This is before we knew the whole story. But this gets to the ring around the rosy thing. And I'll, I'll tell you guys what I mean by this. But he said, Mahomes was born in 1995. Since 1995, the Raiders have won four playoff games. Mahomes has won three Super Bowls. In their entire history, the Raiders have won 25 playoff games. Mahomes has won 15. Maybe the Raiders should be quiet and win some blah, blah, blah. And um, by the way, Mark Sanchez had four playoff wins, which is much, as many as the Raiders had since 1995. So this is when everybody thought it was the team doing it. Now, you got to separate that so there's better understanding. Things get taken out of context. The media takes it. Social media aggregator sites, they go nuts with it. And that's what happened. But that's why you don't even get near it, to my view. Now, you want to talk about beating the Chiefs. They got no problem with that. You got to do it on the field, but the ring around the rosy thing, Jesse and Mo, tell me if I'm wrong on this. It's a little different because they can they can walk they can walk the the walk they can talk the smack because they have beat the crap out of the Raiders, and so it's like yeah, if they did it, and of course that play didn't work, but if they did it and they were a losing team that hadn't been to the playoffs since 2002, the story with the Chiefs would be different. But because they win and because the NFL favors them and markets them. Of course, they're not going to take it makes a difference. And so I think the Raiders should do what they need to do to have an edge over their Chiefs, including the psychology. You just got to be careful. There are so many tentacles <laughs> to this conversation. I know. Scott, could you just give me like two, three minutes with this? Go okay. right ahead. So, so number one, you're right. When you win, you you know, you can do whatever you want, right? I, I there was a there was a video I posted on the X a while ago when the Raiders, I believe, had the charges number. And uh, I believe the head coach at the time said, you know, they, they can do what they want. They, they, they win. You know, they have our number. So mm -hmm. basically, it goes to your point to say when you win football games, you know, you can talk all the trash because, you you know, you, you walk the walk so you can talk the talk, so to speak. With, you know, with Patrick Mahomes as a starter for the Chiefs, he's 10 and 2, I believe, against the Raiders. So the, the sentiment is if you're not winning and if the, the rivalry is lopsided, you have no room to talk. That's one sentiment. But I will say this. As the caller, as uh, Jesse and AZ said, and as we all found out, it wasn't like the Raiders had this Patrick Mahomes doll and they were passing around the locker room. <laughs> this was a fan mm -hmm. who brought the doll to practice. 
So when I saw all of these media outlets saying, oh, the Raiders are poking the bear and all that, this is going to backfire on the Raiders and all this, it wasn't a pre-planned poking at Patrick Mahomes. It was Again, it was a rookie having an innocent moment with a fan. Now, use the B word, okay, whatever. Probably shouldn't have done that. But, I mean, it, it wasn't like the Raiders are, are actively poking the bear after being, you know, 10 and two against Patrick Mahomes as a starter for the chiefs, it, it was an innocent moment that got caught on camera. Of course, there are cameras everywhere because everyone has their phones and their phones can <laughs> record. It was 11 seconds of fun that happened. I, I didn't take it as a big deal. Even, even before we found out that a fan brought it, I didn't take it as a big deal. Patrick Mahomes was act, asked about it. And he said, we'll handle it when we handle it because they're focused on their training camp right now. And I think that's the message. And this is the third point that I'm going to make. That's the message I think Antonio Pierce probably sent to his players that, look, guys, we understand you have you want to have fun with fans and we have a rivalry with the Chiefs, but let, let's just kind of focus on ourselves. Let's not try to get caught up in the cameras and providing bulletin board material because a, a big thing in the NFL and in sports is bulletin board material, right? But I made this point on X that both teams have already have bulletin board material. You talked about how the Chiefs have been, um, the Raiders have been able to beat the Chiefs much since Patrick Mahomes has been born. And the Chiefs just won the Super Bowl on the, in the, on the Raiders' turf. Mm -hmm. Is that not bulletin board material for the Raiders? The Raiders just beat the Chiefs on Christmas in front of their home fans. Is that not enough uh, Not enough bulletin board material for the Chiefs to come out and try to whoop the Raiders for beating them in their last game? The, the Raiders were the last team. Think about this. Though. I believe the Raiders were the last team to beat the Chiefs, right? Right. Or, or in that fashion. So, and Antonio Pierce also saying that, you know, the Raiders have the recipe to beat the Chiefs. You don't think that's bulletin board material? So if you if you need bulletin board material to get up to face your rival, you're in the wrong business. Because rivals off, whether it's the, the rivalry is lopsided or not, in a rivalry, you already have bulletin board material. So I think the whole bulletin board material narrative or, or saying is a little overplayed when you're talking about rivals within the division now if you're talking about the raiders and the ravens or the ravens and another team outside of the division maybe a little different yeah but rivals have built in bulletin board material every year they play each other so <laughs> there's a history bulletin, absolutely it, the whole bulletin board material thing is overplayed but again to wrap this up i think the message from antonio pierce because again he did say we nipped it in the bud and it's over with because right. this this kermit the frog thing got way more play on X, and I think it did in the locker room. I think they addressed it with the rookie, and they said we're going to move on. As as I talk to you today, Scott, and as I talk, talk to Raider Nation right now, I guarantee there's still people on this story. Of course, move on. Move. Yeah. It's not. It's it's a much bigger deal on social media than it is. I guarantee you in the locker room. Of course, it'll come up when the Raiders play play the Chiefs in October and November. But as for right now. It's a dead point. It's a learning experience for Trey Taylor. It's also mm -hmm. a learning experience for the for some of the people who were involved on the fan side that, look, you didn't mean any harm by it, but, you know, things can take a turn on social media that you didn't think would take a turn as it did. We can all move on and say, okay, it was funny. Okay, let's move forward. It's training camp. The Rays are trying to build something special here. And listen, nobody talks better what I, I'm not going to even call it trash. I think – Nobody is as, as I think, fired up about the Raiders being physical and all that as Antonio Pierce. So for him to come out and say, look, we addressed it with the team yesterday. We nipped it in the bud. It's over with. Shows you he understands. You don't want to give, to your point about Bolton, but you don't want to give him anything else. You don't want to give anybody, especially the Super Bowl MVP who just won his third Super Bowl. Why do you want to give him any more motivation? Now, maybe Patrick Mahomes doesn't really care, right? And And whatever. Maybe he just lets it go too. But the point is, to your to what you said is just just play ball right go out and play ball you have an edge on them right now because you beat them the last time you play that's always an edge especially in the division so go out and do it doesn't mean you can't you know stoke the flames of the rivalry when you're about to play them but uh, it definitely got way too much play out there i agree 100 percent. all right now we're going to go to our good buddy Tarek. haven't heard from him in a bit but Tarek calls in today from somewhere in illinois Good afternoon, Scott and Mo. Greetings. This is Tarek checking in with you guys from Aurora, Illinois. Hope Aurora. you gentlemen are well as we head into week two of training camp. The quarterback competition is at kind of what I thought it would be. Um, there, you know, there's been some moments where Aiden O'Connell looks good and then he doesn't look, doesn't, uh, look up to par. And the same thing with Gardner Minshew. I still think Aiden O'Connell will be in the driver's seat and I do, uh, certainly predict that he's going to be the uh, starting quarterback on opening day. 
I'm wondering if the Raiders are going to bring in, in any additional players from free agency. Um, a lot of us talked about um, some possible secondary players. It's still a little early in training camp. Um, Colton Miller is still out. Uh, I think he's going to be back within in about a week. I think uh, it's not necessarily concerning, but, I mean, he is our bona fide starting left tackle. But with a new system in place, a new uh, offensive lineman, and you, it, ideally it's, it's better for him to be out there. It's not concerning, but it is unfortunate that he – hasn't been able to get on the field for kind of an extended period of time. The Kermit the Frog video with Trey Taylor, um, <laughs> interesting. Uh, you know, as much respect as I have for Mahomes and Andy Reid, um, you know, uh, I detest the franchise, the chefs, but I mean, I have nothing but respect for them as a, as a, as a winning team. And, um, you know, considering that the Chiefs have won three of the last four Super Bowls and with the most recent one being in our stadium, Trey Taylor certainly wasn't representative of the rest of the team. And I think Antonio Pierce wasn't pleased. And I think he squashed that immediately. Uh, I like the comments about Spillane and Jack Jones being ticked off about the prediction of being going six and 11 and Antonio Pierce being ranked the 28th uh, ranked head coach in football. But again, you got to win, you got to win and and to make those narratives go away and until the Raiders prove they can uh, be consistent winners. And those are the kind of predictions that they're going to face. Um, hope you guys have a good week, and I look forward to your next shows, and I'll talk to you guys later. Go Raiders. All right, there's our buddy Tarek. Yeah, Mo, the old Frank Sinatra quote, at least it's attributed to him, which is, the best revenge is to have massive success. And I think that's what the Raiders have to do. Yeah, so he touched on basically all the points that we talked about from the Raiders yeah. being ticked off about the media predicting them to go 6-11. and 11. I think I think it was poignant that, Jack Jones and Robert Splane spoke about it publicly because usually players like, ah, oh, we don't care about what the media says. Like, no, we we heard you. Yeah. We're, and we're going to take it personally. I, I, and I like that. Yeah. One thing about this whole Kermit the Frog thing, I know I went a whole two, three minute diatribe about it. <laughs> you know, Trey Taylor mm. is what, 22, 23 years old. Yes. And we, we understand because I know there's an old school approach that, look, don't talk especially if you're a rookie and haven't done it. You're a seventh round rookie. Haven't played a snap in the regular season. Haven't made the team yet. Haven't made the team yet officially. And you're over here calling Patrick Mahomes the B word and, and mocking him. I think that's what rubbed a lot of fans the wrong way. And I understand that. But I said the other side of it is I think he had a learning moment there, Trey Taylor. While a lot of people say, you know, he, he seems like a mature guy coming out of the Air Force and all that stuff. He's still – prone to make mistakes he's still fallible, right right, right. no no Absolutely. we all make we all make mistakes and, and like i said it took 11 it was 11 seconds it was literally 11 seconds of video that got passed around social media and and, and a lot of people were, were clowning him like what is this rookie seventh rounder doing and again i think it was it was a learning experience for him and i think it's all antonio pierce jack jones and Lucas locker room had to say was look we understand you were having a genuine moment with fans but we don't want to put anything out there on social media that takes away from what we're trying to do at training. Absolutely. Camp. We don't want we don't want Kermit the Frog and, and that to be the focus. We want our work at training right. camp to be the focus. Right. That's and again, everybody there, there was no ill intent by the fan or the player, but just know that when they play that first game, you know that video is going to it's be in up. the opening on TV. Oh, yeah. it's, just, it, it's gonna it's not gonna go away until until the Raiders either beat them uh, and then it'll be kind of exercise if they don't beat him then it's going to be all oh, see you fired him up more but oh well all right now we're getting off to our next call screwy louie again for the second show in a row he's calling in from oregon here he is this is screwy louie in oregon how's everything i hope everything's all good in the hood um <laughs> god i enjoyed your um rooster hat the other night cockle doodle do ah. um i have some questions concerning um preseason i'm hoping to see dalton wagner play just to see what he's got and i'm really looking forward for them using Britton brown um in the backfield i think he could make a good running back he just hasn't had a chance because of injuries so i think hopefully we can use him and Faison, i'd like to see what he's got he was injured i believe last year also and Use some of those UDFAs that might have some hidden talent in there. Well, I want to see what some of those guys can do. Um, I think we have a lot of talent to choose from a pretty good pool. Um, if we don't use the money to um, 
get a good corner, a seasoned corner, which we probably could use. Um, I'd like to see some contract extensions for some of the better players um, like Koontz, Spillane, just to mention a few. Um, what do you think of using Brock Bowers as a fullback, maybe to give um, AOC some protection on occasion and maybe some somebody to dump the ball off to if necessary? Um, I think that's pretty much it, really. <laughs> I'm really chomping at the bit here because I don't have a whole lot to talk about. I heard AOC's been doing really well, well, compared to um, – Minshew, anyway. Uh, so I'm hoping he'll be the starter. Um, give me your input. Take care. And God bless. Bye. All right. There's Screwy Louie in Oregon. Well, I'll start OG with the Bro- Screwy Louie. Oh, gee. That's right. Uh, I'll start with the Brock Bowers because Brock Bowers, we know, we've done some interviews here on the show and we've talked about it. Brock Bowers played some H back at Georgia. And so when you talk about a fullback, like a traditional fullback, I don't think. But definitely some sets where you have an H back and he's back there for the purpose of blocking. Um, I do see that happening, don't you? I definitely see it happening for both Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer. I, I yeah. think you're going to see both of those guys move all over the formation. I believe Vinny Bonson, you answered that to uh, someone who was asking about Brock Bowers' role. And I talked about it on my Bleach Report Live last Thursday that Brock Bowers is going to move all over the formation. And I think Michael Mayer is going to have the same type of versatility on offense. So you'll see those guys in different roles. Uh, And you'll probably see Harrison Bryant, who, again, is a John Mackey Award winner. A lot of people didn't notice. Harrison Bryant won the John Mackey Award for most outstanding tight end on the collegiate level. So the Raiders tight end group, to my opinion, is the best in the league. I want to get to some of his other points, Screwy Lewis points. Dalton Wagner, I said this on my Bleach Report Live, too. Dalton Wagner is the most popular Raider. Who hasn't played a snap in the regular season? Yes. Every every show I'm on, whether I'm here at Seven Black today with you, Scott, whether I'm on Bleach Report Live, whether I'm writing an article, someone's always asking me about how does Dalton Wagner look? And there's there's no real update because there's no real buzz about him. Maybe we see him in the preseason. Maybe he has a future as a swing tackle or a right tackle. We'll see. But he's going to be probably the most talked about Raider and anticipated Raider to play in the preseason, assuming he does play in it. Uh, it's going to be very important for him. The other thing is, I've been a Big Britton Brown guy. Screwy Louie mentioned Britton Brown. And I said mm-hmm. this from the beginning that if not for injury, I think Britton Brown has a spot on this roster, and I think he can get significant c- carries if he can stay healthy. Now, the Raiders may be sniffing around a veteran running back, there, but that doesn't mean Britton Brown can't carve out a role for himself. Last thing I'll say about these preseason games and preseason playing time is that because the Raiders don't have joint practices, I think it makes that much more important for them to play against other teams or see other teams on the field in the preseason because they don't have any joint practices with other squads like they had last year. Right. And I think that to, to his question too, I think you'll see some of those guys you mentioned in the third and fourth quarters of these games, um, because you're going to have, you got to get time for guys like Anthony Brown at quarterback because you, you remember the, how important was the third quarterback last year in the NFL? Really important, right? In some cases, the fourth quarterback, which most of them didn't have, or they had to go sign. So, so it's it's so I think you'll see those guys whether or not they're able to look as impressive enough to earn time with the first unit or to to become, like you said, a swing uh, tackle or guard in the in the in the NFL remains to be seen. But good questions by Screwy Lee. All right, uh, Jacob from Fresno called in last week, but we couldn't get his call because it cut out. So hopefully his cell signal is better today. Here is uh, closing out our mailbag segment for the week is Jacob from Fresno. Scott, Hill and Gully Gun Pussy, and Mini 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 Town Mo Moti. <laughs> this is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? Uh, or Jacob the Unifier, whatever the you want. Jacob the me. Unifier. Uh, Here we go. Listen. I'm a little scatterbrained right now, so let me try and gather my thoughts. The thing is, Michael, Macho Man Mayor, and Barack Bowers are the topic of this discussion today. This question that I've got here. These guys, I kind of hinted at, I teased at a little bit with Michael Mayer. Michael Macho Man Mayor. When I think about these guys, I think about when the Hulkster and Macho Man came together. Hey, you you got to respect your brother. I don't know. I'm, I'm not the greatest with wrestling history. I'm more of a football guy. But I just think of that, 
the type of matchup. We've got the two best tight ends in college football over the last four years. These guys are legit. When I, I root for Notre Dame, just like Scott, and I was always like, oh, Michael Mayer, he's the guy. But now, now that both of them are Rangers, I'm like, okay, yeah, Brock Dawes, is, he was better. He was faster. <laughs> he had better hands. He could run, run like nobody else. Only thing Mayer has that I think Bowers might struggle with is more the blocking. But Bowers, I shouldn't even say struggle because they're both top. They're both the best in the nation for years, I guess, in college. But I, my question when have we ever seen a duo like this? Besides the obvious in New England, let's not even get into that. But I want to talk about all the greatest duos in professional sports. Who are some guys that stick out to you? When I think of the Raiders, uh, one, one that just comes off the top of my head is Tim Brown and Jerry Rice. Man, that could have been awesome if we would have gotten the ring for Tim. That would it's. I look back so many times, like man, that should have happened, but it didn't. It didn't. So stop thinking about should have, could have, would have, Raider Nation. That's what we do a lot because we love our history here. But what do you guys think? What are the greatest duos in your opinion? I guess in any sport. I'd like to stick to football, but if you guys want to talk about basketball or whatever, go ahead. Greatest <laughs> duos in any sport. You guys take it easy. Go Raiders. All right, there you go. Jacob and Fresno. Good question. Best duos ever. I mean, we could go on forever, I think, on that one. And he mentioned some of those there, too. And unfortunately, you have one in your own division, which sucks because it's the Chiefs. Because I would say Kelsey and Mahomes. Um, no question. One of the best duos. He mentioned the Patriots uh, and, and so on. And then you go back over time with Montana. He mentioned him. Um, and Montana actually had that connection with a few guys, including Dwight Clark. So you could go on forever. What what pops in your head, Mo? When I, when he talked about duos, I I, I went more of with you know, pass catching duos. Mm -hmm. And I look at when I was growing up and getting into football, the pass catching duos for me two in particular were Isaac Bruce and Torrey Holt, mm. the Rams winning a Super Bowl, of course. And then as a young kid playing on my Dreamcast, I'm showing my age here for people who know what Dreamcast is, it's a video game system console. Randy Moss and Chris Carter, a young Oof. Randy Moss and a veteran Chris Carter together. Those two in Minnesota. And I know that these aren't Raider players, but just coming up, watching the game and understanding how much a dynamic duo at the wide receiver position can impact the game. Now, of course, the Raiders had Tim Brown and Jerry Rice at the end of their careers. Obviously, we can talk about those two guys. But when you talk about like, two guys just coming together and just <clears> having <throat> a just a a great chemistry and great synergy. Torrey Holt, when I was coming up, it was Torrey Holt and Isaac Bruce, Randy Moss and Chris Carter. Now, of course, we're talking about tight ends with Michael Mayer and Brock Bowers, so they may not rack up as many yards as the wide receivers, especially with you got Devontae Andrews, Jacoby Myers out there, and Trey Tucker as well. But I, I think, I honestly, to bring it back to a Raider discussion, I honestly think that the Raiders could have one of the best tight end duos we've seen in a while with Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer. Now, a lot of people are expecting Brock Bowers to kind of take over the primary pass catching role there. But I would say, don't forget about Michael Mayer, you know, because I, I think before Brock Bowers was drafted, a lot of people expected Michael Mayer to take a step. As we all know, he wasn't too fond of the Josh McDaniels offense and expected, I expect him to take a step even before they drafted Brock Bowers, but then together, with those 12 tight end, with those uh, 12 tight end sets, we it was talked about during last week's practice. Vinny Bonsignor pointed out that the tight ends were very involved in that passing attack. And I think both Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer both could have a pretty good season this upcoming year. See, now I think duos, and I go right to music. So I'm thinking the White Stripes, right. Eric B. and Rakim, Outcast. Right. Duos. No, good yeah, stuff. Dude, he, he did say <laughs> Go outside of sports for it. So there you go. There we go. You go by you go by that Ike and Tina Turner. If you want to go way back, <laughs> oh well, that's the way it goes. Anyway, Jacob, thanks for the call, man. I appreciate it. Good, good, good stuff. All right, that's going to close it out, man. We're done, Mo, for this show. We'll we'll, uh, we'll come back on Thursday, and if you're listening to us on the radio in Vegas, we're back on Sunday as we are now. What do you got going this week, man? Tell tell everybody how to find their Midtown Mo. Depth chart predictions. So my first depth chart predictions officially for the offseason. Thursday, over on Bleach Report Live, you can pull up the app. I'm going to 
post the link on on the X. Join me for that. I'll release my first 53 man depth chart predictions over on Sports Night. It's TBD. Give me your ideas. Give me your thoughts of what you want me to write about. Maybe I can make it happen unless the Raiders make some news. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll definitely take your considerations on the X. DM me or shout me out M O E M O T O N on the X. There you have it. All right. We will be back on Thursday, as I mentioned. If you want to call in, leave your message or text 702 900 7869 is that number. We'll be watching the news and always available to you guys on the X, as Mo said, M O E M O T O N for him. I am at LV Gully, the show, S N B today. We appreciate your subscriptions to the audio version of the podcast, wherever you get your audio, as well as our audience on YouTube. Thanks for watching and being involved in the chat. Always fun in the chat. If you haven't done that before, Make sure you climb on. There's great, great conversation happening there during our show. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Momotin, I'm Scott Colbrands, and this has been Silver and Black Today. Take care, everyone.